Hello, hello, hello. Oh, hold on. We're all crooked. Oh my gosh. Off to a ridiculous start. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to science this afternoon. We are going to be covering ecosystems in the biosphere part two. We're going to be looking at a different ecosystem today. Last week, we looked at the woods or the arboreal or the forest ecosystem. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a forest of a different kind, one found under water. Fascinating. Over here, you're going to see the materials you're going to need. A uh, science notebook, a pencil, or a pen if your science notebook is on paper, and access to FOSWeb so you can get to the interactive card sort for today. If you can't, um, just follow along with, your, uh, with this lesson, and afterwards, you can work on uh, getting on FOSWeb so you can log in. And then down here, we've got the I can. I can use text evidence to identify food relationships within the Monterey Bay kelp forest ecosystem. All right, let's get into it. Before we get to the main part of our lesson today, which is going to be doing some sorting around the different organisms found in the kelp forest ecosystem, let's first do a little bit of review, and I'll scoot closer here. Let's do a little bit of review of the different types of organisms you're going to find in a given ecosystem. The different types of organisms. I'll pronounce that one a little bit more clearly. The different types of organisms you can find in an ecosystem. Uh, our first one behind me in yellow is the type of organism that makes their own food. They don't need to eat something else in order to survive. They make their own food, most often from uh, the sun. But there are some exceptions to that that I'll get into in a second. Uh, can anyone remember what is the name for this particular category. It would be producers. I know you had that, right? Producers are the types of organisms that make their own food. Most commonly, this is going to be plants that use a process called photosynthesis to take in the sun's energy and convert it into the energy that they, those plants need to survive. Now, not all producers photosynthesize. Almost all of them do, but not all of them do. There are actually, believe it or not, there are actually some organisms, some type of bacteria that live way, way down in the deepest parts of the ocean. So far down and so deep that sunlight actually doesn't even reach there. There's a point at which sunlight coming down, hitting the surface of the water and going down, 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 down. Eventually it gets to a point where the rays of light don't travel that far and it's completely pitch black. Because of this, plants can't photosynthesize because they, the sun doesn't get, travel down that far. So if a plant was down that far, it had no way of getting any energy. But there are some bacteria that actually can make their own food using the heat coming from the inner layers of the earth, coming from things like, you know, what we, I think they're called geothermal vents of heat from the earth coming, uh, heat from inside the Earth's crust and into the mantle coming up and uh, being exposed to those deepest parts of the ocean. And they live right near those geothermal vents and actually can use the heat from, um, use the heat from the Earth to make their own food. Fascinating stuff. And Cole says in the chat, is it the ones that make their own light? Great question. Slightly different thing. That's a thing called bioluminescence. And that's not a version of making its own food. It's uh, different organisms use because of the chemical makeup or, you know, in the case of like an angler fish can actually produce and use energy to make its own light to, um, to uh, perhaps attract prey or attract a mate or something like that. So bioluminescence and producing your own food without sunlight. Slightly different, but I definitely see the connection and I like it. All right, next. What type of organism gets their energy from other organisms? These are the organisms that eat stuff. This answer is, there we go, consumers. Consumers are the 
large group of organisms, a large category of organisms that um, have to consume other organisms in order to survive. These are our herbivores that only eat plants, only eat our producers. Uh, these are our carnivores that only eat meat, only eat other consumers. And then there are the omnivores that eat kind of both and everything. Okay, there are also scavengers that only eat dead meat. Okay, they don't hunt for themselves. Uh, sort of a subsection of carnivore in that case. The last one, behind me in pink, which organisms consume dead organic matter and create our favorite substance of all, our humus. Our humus, our nutrient-rich um, our nutrient rich substance that when mixed with the soil allows for um, new plant life and it allows that energy to be reused. These would be the decomposers. Somebody mentioned earthworms in the chat. Those would be our decomposers. They're eating all the dead stuff. And within these three categories, we can see some connections. We already talked about uh, producers getting their energy from, in most cases, the sun. So we're gonna draw our arrow of energy there, okay? And then consumers can get their energy by consuming producers or by consuming other consumers. They're not eating themselves, obviously, but they're eating other consumers, right? Can consumers also eat decomposers? A lot of cases, yeah, they can. Thinking about fish eating worms, right? And there's a good example, right? Or anything that eats insects, smaller insects that act as decomposers, right? Then decomposers get their energy when plants or animals when plants or animals die. That's my little skull there for, well, I guess Plants wouldn't have skulls, but you know what I mean. So decomposers get their energy from producers and consumers once they die and start to, again, start to decompose with the help of those things like bacteria or worms or that kind of thing. Okay, so that's kind of what a larger scale food web looks like. Remember, a food chain is just one direction showing the flow of energy. A food web is when we're talking about kind of all of these things working together. And we're going to look at that on FOSWeb today. So reminder, when you, oh, there's the chat. That's fun. Um, when you go to FOSWeb, remember you're going to log in, you're going to click on living systems. That's the one with the sea turtle on it. And then you're going to get here. Remember your student page is going to look a little different than my teacher page, but it's got a lot of the same stuff. You're going to find where it says card sorts. You're going to click it. It's gonna open up and then you're gonna select Monterey Bay Ecosystem Card Sort, either in English or in Spanish, whatever your primary language is. Okay, you're gonna click it. And then once it loads, it's gonna open up and you should see this. I'll give you a quick tutorial because again, we did this last week, so I don't wanna to spend too much time on it. But when you click, here are all your organisms and you'll see all these organism cards over here on the side. And you grab one, drag it out to your workspace, click zoom and zoom in to read it. Sea otters rarely leave the water. They dive to the bottom of the kelp forest in search of food. When the sea otter finds food, it returns to the surface and floats on its back to eat its meal. It is adorable. I added that last part, that doesn't say it there. Food, what does it eat? Sea urchins, turban snails, octopuses, abalone, predator, killer whales. So now what we want to do is we want to start making connections. If we can find an organism that either eats the sea otter or is eaten by the sea otter, we can add it to our board and use a, uh, use a arrow to show the flow of energy. So I'm going to grab purple sea urchin because that was first. Put it there and then remember we're showing where the energy goes. So since the purple sea urchin is eaten by the sea otter and the sea otter uses its energy, we're gonna show the energy going from the sea urchin to the sea 
otter. Uh, let's zoom in and read the sea urchin and we can make a connection here. A sea urchin moves about, moves about on tiny tube feet. Its mouth is in the center of its underside. The mouth has five teeth and opens and closes like a bird's beak. The tough teeth scrape algae off rocks. Food, algae, and decaying material from dead plants and animals. Predators, sea otters, sea stars, lobsters, fish. Predators bump sea urchins off rocks and bite into their exposed undersides. All right, so we've got our purple sea urchin. We said algae, decaying material from dead plants and animals. And actually one thing that I want to bring up is sea urchins do eat, even though it's not listed on here. It's, yeah, there it is. You'll see it in the predator section. Sea otters do eat giant kelp. And this is our kelp forest with all these big strands of giant kelp with their big leaves, their big wide leaves up near the top to catch all those sun's rays and photosynthesize because it is a producer. Okay, It's attached to the rocks by what are called holdfasts. And it's even got, if you, if you were to see some bigger pictures, you see those little, they kind of look like balloons. Those are called pneumatocysts and they help the leaves float. Very cool stuff, giant kelp. So giant kelp makes its own food through photosynthesis. It is eaten by abalone, crabs, sea urchins, and fish. So we're gonna do an arrow from the kelp to the sea urchin. And one thing about this particular chain is sea urchins, because they, it takes them a while to move around. They don't just eat the kelp leaves. They actually eat the kelp holdfasts on the rocks at the very bottom. So it's actually really important that the sea otters are eating the sea urchins. If there's too many sea urchins, they eat the kelp holdfasts and they break the kelp off the rocks and the, kelp, the whole kelp forest floats away. Sea urchins can actually um, take out an entire kelp forest if left to their own devices. So sea otters are really important because not very many things eat sea urchins. Just sea otters, sea stars, lobsters, fish, right? And it takes a lot of work to get those sea urchins off. So they don't eat them very often. That's why sea otters are so important here. Okay, uh, we also had, as we start to, let's see, let's go back to our sea otter. Uh, sea otters, oops, zoom in again. What else do sea otters eat? Sea otters also eat turban snails and octopus. So let's grab a turban snail and show our energy. And let's grab an octopus. And we'll scoop this down a little bit. Remember, if you want to get rid of an arrow, just put it back on the arrow thing and get the one you need. Okay, sea otters eat octopus. There we go. And perfect. Let's see, turban snails, if we zoom in. Turban snails eat kelp, so we can do some arrows from, oh, from the kelp to the turban snail. There we go. Ta-da. Okay, and then let's see, I noticed a connection. I saw octopus eat crustaceans such as crabs and lobsters. Good to know. And kelp is eaten by crabs. So let's see if we can find a crab because that can be a connection from, aha, look at that, the kelp crab. Double check here with our zoom button. Oh, eats kelp, it's a fitting name. And predators, octopus, giant kelp fish, and the Garibaldi. Let's, we're gonna grab that Garibaldi in a second because I love the Garibaldi. But first, let's put in these arrows. So do you notice how we're making like a, just a whole kind of web going on, showing where energy goes? Sea otters, kind of our top predators in this case, because um, the only thing that eats it are killer whales and we don't have a killer whale card. Let's grab our Garibaldi, because I do love the Garibaldi. And we're gonna zoom in on the Garibaldi because I just love it so much. Garibaldi live in rocky bottoms in open areas and protected shallow bays. Adults are very territorial and will defend their small area of the kelp bed. They will charge any invader, including fish and scuba divers. Garibaldi is the California state marine fish. And it's bright orange. Look at this thing. Garibaldis are amazing and they do not care. They will run at you if you get in their space, even if you're way bigger than it. It has no fear whatsoever. It's pretty awesome. 
uh, I would encourage you after you do the exit ticket to look up uh, some Garibaldi videos on uh, the YouTubes or somewhere thereabouts. Let's see, it eats sponges, sea anemones, algae, worms, crustaceans. There's our crabs again. Clams, mussels, snail eggs, their own eggs. Whoa, kind of a garbage fish. It kind of eats everything. Incredible. So let's grab from the crab to the Garibaldi. There we go. We also had our turban snail. So we're going to need some arrows coming back this way here because I remember our turban snail is also eaten by Garibaldis. So we need lots of arrows to get it over there. Oy, oy, oy. Ugh. There we go. Aha. All right. Now, take a look at that. We've got ourselves a bona fide food web going here. Awesome. So your exit ticket today is similar to the one we did last week. So you're going to be going into FossWeb, opening up the card set, and trying this out on your own, reading the card, seeing what eats it and what it is eaten by, and then making some connections. And then in the um, document on Google Classroom, going ahead and sharing out a few of those connections. Okay, everybody, I hope this was uh, a really informative and a cool look at one of my favorite, I, and I don't say this just about anything, one of my actual favorite ecosystems on the planet is the Monterey Bay kelp forest. I think it's fascinating. I think there's, um, it's a great example too of what's happening with climate change because the kelp forest is changing and new species are coming in and old species are starting to die out and, and populations are going up and down. And so lots of things are changing because it's a very, it's a very fragile ecosystem. And so I think it's one that definitely deserves our study and our close look. All right, everybody. Uh, good luck on the exit ticket. Uh, writing group A, I will see you in about 10 minutes for our small group. And uh, have fun. No secret word for this lesson. Just uh, do the exit ticket. Uh, do the reading in the FossWeb ebook after that. And I think that's it. Cheers.